keynote panel. My name is Herb Garrity. It's nice to see you all again. Um, this panel is on countering ableism in medicine. So something that we like to do at the Rehumanized Conference is this idea where at a lot of conferences, you see academics and you see experts in different fields. And we have those academics, we have PhDs, we have Rachel McNair, we have everyone um, who are really experts in whatever issue they are focusing on. But something else that we want to address is this idea that we're all experts. We're all experts in who we are and how we live and how we move through the world. Um, and that is why on this panel, we are so excited to have three self-advocates for disability rights talking about ableism in medicine. Um, so I'd like to thank them all for being here. We have Katie Shaw with Down Syndrome Indiana. We have Katie, oh, sorry, Kelly Matula, who is actually the president of Rehumanize Pittsburgh. And we have Beth Fox, who is one of my favorite people that I follow on Facebook because she's hilarious. <laughs> And she is a disability rights advocate, so I'm so excited to have them here. Um, you guys can get started. Once I figure out how to turn this mic off. Here. Someone works here. Go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Jean Shaw, but m most everyone calls me Katie. Thank you for letting me speak with, with Kelly and Bethany to you today. I am from Indianapolis, Indiana, a born and raised Hoosier. <laughs> My journey here has taken about three years, but I am so happy to be here to witness and meet so many people helping to make the world better. In 2015 and 2016, I was volunteering with Down Syndrome Indiana and had the opportunity to meet Sue Swayze Liebel. She is the VP of Public Affairs for Indiana Right to Life. She asked me to help her lobby to get House Bill 1337 passed. That is where I had the, the privilege of meeting Mary O'Callaghan, who was also their lobby. Mary will be speaking in, in the next session. I hope you can hear her talk on prenatal diagnosis. After lobbying with her and Sue, Mary invited me to speak to the Vita Institute at Notre Dame in Indiana. I have spoken there three times and the Vienna Institute Conference in New York City, along with Cardinal Book. Through the Vienna Institute, I met Amy Murphy, who invited me here today. Many thanks to Amy and Rehumanize International. As I was asked if I could speak to you today about ableism. That word is a little foreign to me. Isn't that great? <laughs> but let me tell you, lobbying for House Bill 1337 makes me understand that ableism does happen. So let me share my story with you, please. I would like to share what doing away with ableism can do and a little about my wonderful life with you. I am 33 years old and I have Down syndrome. As I mentioned, I was born in Indianapolis. I began learning sign language at six months, walked and started preschool at two, dance lessons at four. I went to kindergarten and most of first grade with no aid. At the end of first grade, I got a part-time aid because my fine model skills were a little slow and I could not keep up with the writing. In elementary, I played softball, took piano lessons, received First Holy Communion, and was a Girl Scout. In middle school, I began playing the violin in a school orchestra, ran cross-country, worked on the yearbook, and was confirmed at my church 
St. Michael's of, in of Indianapolis. High school, I continued with the violin and managed the softball team. Most of my classes were regular ed. I also had some special ed, like math and economics. Math is not my, my forte. <laughs> In addition, I attended Geneva Light Career Center to help prepare me for a job in childcare. Since high school, I worked five years in childcare and received my early childhood development associate certificate from Ivy Tech. In 2009, I changed career paths and went into retail at J.C. Penney's. I still work there and I love it. I am on the board of directors for Dodge Center Indiana, DSI, and volunteer there putting data into the computer and speaking to school age children about disabilities. I have, I have also spoken to IU medical residents about caring for people with Down syndrome and other disabilities. They have always seemed welcoming. One of my proudest accomplishments is that I earned my GED or high school currency diploma. About three years ago, I got a personal trainer. And let me tell you, she can give a workout. <laughs> I did the Indianapolis Mini Marathon, and I plan to do it again in 2019. I am still volunteering at DSI and at my parish, St. Alphonsus Liguori in Zionsville, Indiana. I have a busy life, but it is a wonderful life probably just like most of you. My dad and mom found out I had Down syndrome when mom was pregnant with me. My, mom, my mom's doctors never mentioned abortion. My parents feared the, the unknown and were sad that I would have surgery as soon as I was born. But the doctors started helping my parents plan what would help me have a wonderful life. The day after I was born, I was baptized and went into surgery for a bowel obstruction. After a few weeks in the hospital, I got my first assignment in helping others. I came home and helped my mom celebrate her 29th birthday. <laughs> During my mom's next pregnancy, the doctors encouraged an amniocentesis. So my mom and dad would have known if there were any complications. Because there had been no issues, they declined. All was well until six weeks after my sister's birth. Kelly became ill and had to be tested for meningitis. Change of plans and worries. But again, the doctors and my parents focused on giving Kelly the care she needed. My sister and I love to exercise together and, ju and just hang out together. We have wonderful lives as sisters. When my mom was pregnant the next time, a test did come back positive for a disability, possibly Down syndrome. No one suggested abortion. My parents and the doctors focused on what was needed. The next test showed there had been a false positive. If she had been encouraged to have an abortion, my now six foot two inch baby brother, <laughs> who is a professional animator, and I would never had a chance to enjoy each other's wonderful lives. Besides that, he's a pretty good protector of me. He's my go-to guy. <laughs> I share these things with you because I believe as you do that every life is wonderful. My parents have always been pro-life. So they have always taught me that every life is a gift, that every life is wonderful. But the, the older I get, the more I realize not everyone sees that. Ableism is not just seen in the medical field. As we all know, many people would prefer to end the pregnancy if, the, if the, there even might be a problem 
and the mom try again. That is why I want to help unborn babies and their moms and everyone see what a wonderful we can all have. As I said at the beginning, we lobby to get House Bill 1337 passed. Though it passed, a federal judge placed a permanent injunction against it. The bill would have made Indiana only the second state to stop a baby from being aborted just because it has Down syndrome, like me, or a, another disability. It would also prevent a baby from being aborted because of the gender or race. Finally, it required that babies that do die from abortion at least are buried or cremated. Until this bill is put into place, those aborted babies will continue to be put in trash barrels and taken to, to dumps with, with old pizza boxes and other trash from our homes. Many women say that this bill is burning them when they're just trying to get informed decisions about their health care. That is not true. Doctors and all of us can educate and help the mother see what a wonderful life their baby can have. Just like the doctors did with my parents. That would help the mother's health care and the baby's health care. Right now, the injunction is being appealed. I ask for your prayers that it will be appealed and the law will be put into effect. We must keep fighting for civil rights of the most defenseless. I am sure some of you in this room have seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life. It's about how one particular man being born helped make a world a better place. His life was not perfect. It did not go as he had planned. There was sorrow, <coughs> money problems, and illness. But there was much more of love, happiness, and joy. Every person in this room with or without Down syndrome has experienced those things. That is part of the wonderful life God gave us. Again, I want to thank you, Amy, and Rehumanize International for letting me share my story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for being here, for all the work each of you are doing to help so many, many people have wonderful lives. I would like to close with a quote from part of Psalm 139. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God be with you all. Thank you. that caused premature labor starting at 18 weeks. Several doctors, but not, not her primary obstetrician or any doctor that she saw for any length of time, said that she should not try to continue the pregnancy and should start over because her life was at risk and a complicated pregnancy with a possibly disabled child might not be worth continuing. But she made clear to her doctors that she wanted everything possible to be done to save me and that was a decision that they respected. I ended up being born at three weeks with uh, 
congenital problems and I suffered brain damage. I was in the, the neonatal intensive care unit for two months and a rehab hospital for two further months. And then I ended up, as I said, having uh, cerebral palsy, visual impairment, and several other complicated medical conditions. Um, I was given really great care in the NICU by all the doctors and nurses. But when I got home, my parents noticed something interesting. Every year at Halloween, the uh, NICU would have a Halloween party for all of the graduates of the NICU, which is a term for uh, babies that survived to grow up. And uh, this was televised on the local news and used as a reunion and also a public relations opportunity. Even though the hospital had my parents' contact information because they pretty regularly contacted them to have me come back and do research studies there, which my parents were more than happy to do, uh, I never got invited to go to the Halloween party. And my parents noticed that no, only healthy looking kids were at the Halloween party or shown on TV. No kids that had any, you know, that looked sick or had any disabilities. So I, with my obvious surgical scars and supplemental oxygen, and then later with uh, big leg braces and thick glasses and an eye patch, I never got to go to that party. And uh, even though all their doctors gave the same great care to people with disability, to babies that ended up having disabilities as they did to babies that ended up fine, it seemed like the hospital thought that those of us that ended up sick or disabled weren't the kind of success stories that they wanted to celebrate. Even though we had been taken care of and survived, we were somehow seen as bad publicity. Um, several years later, when I was going to be enrolling in a preschool program for handicapped children, I was required to have an evaluation by an occupational therapist. Um, she, she knew nothing about me before this except that I had been born prematurely and had cerebral palsy, but she assumed based on that that I was cognitively impaired. She spent about 30 minutes with me, and at the end of that time, she said to my mom that I was, quote, incapable of learning. Mm -hmm. My mom asked her what she was basing that on, and she didn't mention anything that she had seen over the last half hour, just quoted things about my diagnoses and conditions. Um, when she asked my mom if, I, if she had any questions, I piped up and said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that all of my all of my knowledge and everything that it seemed like I knew was just due to parroting other people. Um, I like to think that we put her in her place a little bit, but it still really bothers me that a uh, therapeutic professional was willing to stand off her prejudices about the disabled rather than evidence that was sitting right in front of her. Since that time, I've been really, really lucky and not encountered a whole lot of ableism in my medical care. I think a lot of this is due to the fact that my parents, who are both doctors themselves, really carefully vetted all of the doctors that I saw. Um, several of my doctors that I saw as a kid were family friends, and uh, with one of whom uh, we used to joke that all of my uh, report cards and, and grades and everything, and eventually acceptances to multiple Ivy League colleges were, quote, pretty good for someone who apparently has mental retardation, which was <laughs> the term that was used at the time, even though we don't use that now. Um, so, but I know that I was really lucky not to have faced more issues in my medical care. I know that I, I learned a lot of things that helped with that, namely being very upfront about my uh, needs and communicating what I needed to people. But I know that some of it was also due to the fact that I don't have serious speech impediment, I'm not cognitively impaired, I don't have other communication difficulties, so that I was you know, able to communicate with medical professionals and they would listen to me. I also, uh, luckily, I've only rarely needed to use a wheelchair after orthopedic surgery so that if there were accessibility issues like a broken elevator or a ramp that was far away, I could deal with you know, going up a couple of stairs or going up the curb, whereas I know that a lot of other people with disabilities would not be able to get to care if that were the case. Um, 
So I know that I have been really lucky in a lot of ways, um, in part due to these experiences and uh, having a lot of health problems in general. My PhD research has focused on how to, how to communicate to patients about their medical care and how to improve patients' understanding of, of their medical care or procedures that they might be receiving. And some of the things that we found in our research is that it's very important to use simplified language and talk to people beforehand about uh, con what concerns they might have when communications are being designed. I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm defending my dissertation uh, next week. I'm still looking for a job, but I really hope that whatever kind of job that I get will allow me to use this research and my experiences to help not only all patients understand their medical care, but uh, most importantly, people with disabilities, because I know we have so many extra barriers to our medical care, and I really want to be able to uh, give back and help other people with disabilities when I have had you know, a relatively easy time of a lot of these things. And I think that perhaps the most important thing that we can do as uh, people with disabilities or family members of people with disabilities to kind of face down ableism in our medical care you know, I, most of my stories are a little bit funny. It's nice to be able to, you know, laugh at ourselves or make other people laugh. But most importantly, we have to uh, communicate our needs clearly and upfront, but also help our medical providers to see us as, pe see us as people first. See the whole person so that they are, you know, motivated to provide care for this person and then also help them to address help them to address any needs that we might have, but it's important that everybody see us as people first, rather than as a collection of problems that they have to somehow solve. And um, I really want to thank you all for being here and uh, listening to my story and being willing to help us counter these issues in medicine and learn more about them. She had noticed that I hadn't been moving around and kicking as much as my brother had, but you know, every kid is different, every pregnancy is different, so she didn't really think a whole lot about it um, until she went in for the ultrasound. And um, the doctor ended up telling her that it appeared that about a couple weeks prior to this ultrasound, my growth and development had, stu had stunted. Um, and even though I was about 21 weeks, I was um, size-wise and developmental-wise more about 16 weeks. Um, and they continued to watch it. They um, did an amniocentesis. At first, they thought I might have spina bifida. Um, that test came back negative. So they didn't really know what was going on. Um, but the doctor told my mom that based on what they were seeing and the fact that my growth and development had stunted, um, that they didn't think that I would survive to term and that if she did manage to carry the pregnancy and have a successful delivery, um, that I would have such severe disabilities that I wouldn't have a life worth living. And they told her that her most merciful option would be to terminate the pregnancy. Um, they also, because they didn't know what was going on, um, they weren't able to say whether the condition would in any way endanger her life or anything like that. Um, 
Later in my life, I was diagnosed with a rare form of muscular dystrophy, congenital myotonic dystrophy. And clinically, the doctors were, uh, prognosis was dead on. Uh, most kids with congenital myotonic dystrophy don't survive to birth. Um, most of them are miscarried or stillborn. Those who do survive to birth, 30 to 40% die within the first couple weeks. Um, and it's rare for someone with the condition to live past their 20s. Um, but as far as quality of life, they couldn't have been more wrong. Because <laughs> my life is very much worth living. And I am grateful every day that my mom had the strength and the courage to tell those doctors that abortion wasn't her option. Um, that she wanted to fight for me and she wanted to give me the chance to fight. Um, when I was a teenager, my mom and I talked about it and we talked about uh, what she felt during that pregnancy and how <laughs> the mix of, of fear and joy um, that she felt. Um, there aren't any pictures of my mom when she was pregnant or any um, like newborn photos of me. Um, there's actually only one photo that we found of me before I was six months old um, because that's about the time that things started stabilizing and they realized that I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> um, but, so I'm, I'm so glad that my mom gave me that chance to fight. Um, and my life definitely has been a fight. I, I won't lie about that. Um, but I don't consider myself severely disabled. Um, I believe that I have challenges, but I believe that we all have challenges. Um, Katie said that math isn't her forte. <laughs> math is my forte. <laughs> like, math and science, like, I think that's fun. So, um, so like, but I have trouble climbing stairs. So you can climb stairs, you can't do math. I can do math, I can't do stairs. Like, they're just kind of the same to me. Uh, so um, growing up before I was diagnosed, I, I would go to see doctors. Um, I was a very clumsy child um, because my muscles didn't work right and that makes you clumsy. Uh, and so I was frequently getting hurt. It, uh, and sick. Um, I have a very compromised immune system um, because of the condition. And doctors were um, often accusing me of exaggerating my symptoms to get attention. Um, there were times when they, um, especially with injuries, that they started questioning my parents and whether they were abusing or neglecting me that were leading to all of these injuries. Um, because at that point, I didn't look disabled. I looked just like any other kid. Um, and so they didn't understand how somebody who looked okay on the outside could be having the serious medical issues that I was having. Um, so when I finally got diagnosed, I was like, all right, this is it. Like doctors are gonna believe me now. Things are gonna get better. Um, but I was wrong um, because when you have uh, what they call in the medical community a life-limiting condition, um, Typically, in the medical community, the word um, terminal isn't used until um, death is expected within six months. So it's not like a hard and fast. It's not wrong to say terminal before that. Um, but usually, they say life limiting um, when, you're, when they expect more than six months of life. Um, so anyway, uh, when you have a life limiting condition and you've already lived longer than the vast majority of people with your condition, a lot of doctors don't think, they're, don't think they're worth their time anymore. Um, and I've seen that time and time again. Um, almost exactly a year ago, I uh, fractured my fibula on my right leg, which is the uh, smaller of the two bones in the, the lower leg. Um, I ended up going to the ER because the pain was so bad. And the ER doctor came in, refused to run any tests, um, and literally asked me why I was wasting the time of the ER staff um, because I had pain when I have a chronic pain condition. And he wrote me a prescription for a couple days of narcotics and sent me home. Um, so I went to my primary care physician the next day and she was livid, as she should have been. <laughs> um, and so she sent me to an orthopedic specialist and they did the x-rays and treated it um, and we got it taken care of. Um, but he just, wanted, he just wanted to brush it off. Um, and uh, about a month later, uh, I developed pneumonia, which is a relatively 
frequent issue for me. Um, I have very weak respiratory muscles. I can't fully inflate my lungs on my own. Um, that's what I've been doing up here with this. It's not a It is a ventilator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going as the Cheshire Cat for Halloween this year. <laughs> um, so I didn't have the ventilator yet at that point. Um, and I, I frequently get pneumonia because of the respiratory muscles. Um, I can't clear um, the mucus and stuff that we all naturally have in our lungs to clear the junk out. I can't do that on my own. Um, so this one infection, it wasn't clearing up. We'd done multiple rounds of antibiotics and steroids, um, and I just wasn't able to breathe very well. Um, so my doctor arranged for me to have a direct admit to the local hospital. Um, and when I got there for intake, um, I realized very quickly that they were trying to covertly ask me to sign a DNR. Um, nobody came out directly and asked me if I wanted to sign a DNR, um, but they were describing in what I believe was quite excessive detail, the amount of pain that it would cause if my heart went into an irregular rhythm and they had to shock it back, um, or how terrible it would be if my breathing got so bad that I had to be on a ventilator because with this condition, if I went on a ventilator, I'd be on the ventilator my rest of my life. And they asked me who would want to live like that. Well, I've had my ventilator almost a year and I can tell you, me. <laughs> What, I don't. I don't care that I have a chronic disorder. I, I know my life looks different than most people my age. But yeah, if something life-threatening comes up, I want you to do everything possible to save my life. That's why I'm at the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came. Um, um, so they kept me for a week until the infection cleared up, um, and then they sent me home and told me they couldn't do anything else for me. Um, even though my oxygen levels were still regularly dropping down into the 80s, which is um, low enough that it can cause damage to the body tissues. Um, so fortunately, once again, my uh, primary care doctor stepped in to save the day again. Um, and I went to see a pulmonologist that I was seeing at the time in Duke, and he did prescribe the ventilator. Um, and he was... He was very careful when he prescribed it to um, make sure that I understood that this wasn't going to improve my respiratory function, um, that this wasn't going to allow me to breathe better. Um, it was just going to make it more comfortable for me, um, that it would take some of the work of breathing off from me, but if I ever stopped using it, I would go back to where I was. I, I'm not going to be able to breathe on my own again um, unless there's some sort of Miraculous healing, which I'm totally open to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he wrote the prescription. The uh, between insurance and the durable medical equipment providers, they were estimating that it would take four to six weeks for me to get the ventilator. Um, and my primary care doctor and I were like, "That's ridiculous. We need it today." Um, so she and her wonderful staff made daily calls, um, multiple daily calls. Um, to my insurance provider to get it cleared, and then as soon as it got cleared, they were making multiple daily calls to the uh, durable medical provider company um, expressing the urgency of this, um, and they got me the ventilator in less than a week. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they definitely did the right hand. <laughs> um, during that time, I was going in, um, and they were giving me uh, daily ster steroid injections because that was the only thing that was giving me enough airway clearance that I could um, keep my oxygen levels in the low 90s, which is not a comfortable place to be, but it's not a dangerous place to be. Um, so I got the ventilator, and it has greatly improved my quality of life. I have so much more energy, um, and yeah, it's, it's fun to joke about being hookah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to uh, I want to close my talk. We've given you examples of what ableism looks like in medicine, um, <laughs> from the doctors literally telling you you're not worth their time or their effort to um, the well-meaning nurses who 
look at you with your disability and say, well, I could never live like that. Um, which I know that they mean well, that they're saying that I'm strong and they're, they're, they're glad that I'm fighting this, but they're also implying that it'd be okay for me to give up, that, that, they, that they give up, that they don't see the value of my life. Um, and sometimes it's the little offhanded comments like that that hurt as much as the people that are outright obviously not respecting your personhood. Um, but I want to close with um, a medical memory that I treasure, which those aren't very frequent. Um, and I'm so fortunate, I've mentioned her a couple times, my primary care provider is fantastic and she is, in my mind, the picture of what medicine should look like. Um, and so this year we finally had the um, talk that I think both of us had been dreading since she became my provider, um, and that was the discussion of end-of-life care. And um, what do we do when this does progress enough that I can't breathe at all on my own? Um, and I'm no longer able to really think and act. And when, when the disease does progress to the point where there's, there's just nothing to fight anymore. Um, and I sat in her office. Um, I had a couple friends help me draft an, an advanced directive. Um, fortunately, I have a good friend who is licensed to practice law in Virginia. Um, he looked over it several times to make sure that everything was legally sound in it and um, clear. And then I took it into my doctor and we sat in her office for over an hour and went over it, um, every little section of it, making sure that she understood very clearly all of my wishes and not just what they were, but why they were what they were. Um, so that if there was a situation that wasn't expressly in the advanced directive, she would know my thought process for what I had written to better know how to provide the care that I would want if I weren't able to express my decisions on my own. Um, and after we did that, uh, she looked me in the eye and she said, Beth, I will fight this as long and as hard as you want to. Um, and when it, when, it comes to the, when it comes to that time that we're at the end and there's nothing left to fight, I will be by your side to make it as comfortable as possible. And I just think that that is exactly the attitude that doctors should have. Um, we shouldn't immediately be resorting to terminate the pregnancy or let's legalize assisted suicide so that people who are in pain and have disabilities don't have to live with it. Um, doctors, the medical community, all of us, we should be standing together to encourage each other to fight for life. Because um, as I said before, we all have challenges. Um, just because mine are physical doesn't mean that they affect my quality of life more or make my life any less valuable. Um, and I think that that is really the key. Um, the medical community um, and just people in general, if they could learn to see um, myself and the other ladies up here as the person inside instead of the disability that they often see first. Um, I feel like so often when I go to see a new doctor, they see the disease, they see the disorder, but they don't see Beth. Um, and I think that that is so much the contributing factor to the ableism in our medical community um, because they see the disease and they just want to get rid of the disease by whatever means necessary. Uh, but we have to understand that we can't get rid of disease by getting rid of people with diseases. Um, um, we don't eradicate the flu by euthanizing you when you get the flu. So why do we do it for Down syndrome and muscular dystrophy and spina bifida, cerebral palsy, all of these different disorders um, that have physical symptoms just like the flu? Um, actually, less so because you're not going to catch muscular dystrophy from me. <laughs> it's not contagious. <laughs> um, so I, I know that most of the people in this room um, agree with what I just said. And I know many of you in here do see the people behind and that's why you're here. Um, so I want to encourage you when you, go, when you leave this conference and you go out, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, when you see ableism in the medical community, when you see ableism in the world, don't be afraid to stand up and say this isn't right. We should be respecting these people. Um, we should be standing with them.
There are people just like us, and they deserve our love and our respect and our compassion just like us. Um, and I think that if we can all do that, um, then I do believe that eventually we can live in a world where we won't have to have sessions like this uh, because eventually we'll get to the point that ableism in the medical community and ableism in general are the ex exception instead of the rule. Tease me a little bit, but like, oh, you're not going to be a real doctor. <laughs> you're just getting a PhD. <laughs> I think, you know, the more of us and the more, you know, people that, you know, care about these issues are in medicine and medical adjacent fields, the better things will be. And the quicker we'll get to that world that Beth mentioned where we don't have to sit in a room and talk about this because. It's really rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my first master's degree was in public health. Um, and I got asked like that, like, what do you, how are you gonna go out into the field and practice public health? Um, and it, public health is all around us. Accessibility is public health. Um, and I, even at a Christian university, I had to fight that. Um, I had to fight to get my peers in my program to understand that addressing ableism and making um, things accessible to people with disabilities was a public health issue. Um, and actually, um, I had the opportunity to go to the like National Public Health Conference um, about two years ago when I was in the program. Um, it ended up not working out, um, but I'm kind of glad that it didn't um, because the keynote speaker for their main session was Cecile Richards. Oh, yeah. And they were all going on and on about how she was doing so much for public health and advancing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I just, I, I don't, I don't know that I could have contained myself if I had been there. <laughs> um, so definitely, if you, if you have a disability and you can get out into the medical community, go for it. Um, if you don't have a disability and you can get out into the medical community and just show that you care about people with disabilities as people, do it. <laughs> Lauren? So my question is for all of you ladies is, do you feel like things have gotten any better with dealing with the ableism in the medical community since we were children? Or do you think that really it hasn't improved much? Do you feel like doctors now are still just as bigoted as they always were 30 years ago? Yeah. Before you guys answer, can everyone hear OK without the mic, or would you rather the mic? We prefer the mic. OK, cool. Sorry about that. So you guys should pass it down. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of have a mixed answer to that. Um, as far as like with prenatal diagnoses and stuff, I would almost say that it's actually gotten worse um, just because we are able to diagnose so many things in utero now. Um, and that's, that is like the main focus of my advocacy because I think that prenatal testing could be a wonderful thing. Um, for parents to be able to know that their child is going to come into this world and have respiratory issues or need heart, or heart surgery um, or have these different things so that they can be prepared um, and they can learn about that and be prepared to give birth at a hospital that is specialized and able to take care of that. If we did prenatal testing for that so that we could actually combat the disease or the disorder, I think that would be wonderful and I think that would be a tremendous use of these tests. 
Um, but instead, they're being used to screen out children. Um, and the, 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 the recommendation almost always when you get a poor prenatal prognosis is to terminate the pregnancy. Um, and that's, that's still the case just as much as it was when I was born in 92. Um, it's just that now, um, if my mom were in, my, were in that situation today, they'd be able to tell her what I had. Um, but the recommendation would probably still be the same. Um, as far as like with doctors after birth, I'm not really sure um, because most of my um, most of my specific remember, memories of ableism in medicine has been more uh, since I was an, at least a, a teen or a young adult, um, and that's when a lot of my physical challenges started manifesting. Um, so I'm not really sure if I had had these challenges as a young adult in the 90s or 80s, if ableism would have been more or less of an issue. Um, but I think that we definitely still have a long way to go. facilities being accessible, um, there's definitely more uh, emphasis on, you know, prenatal diagnosis and pushing for abortion, I think, than there used to be. Um, but, it, but it's hard for me to judge partly because a lot of the issues that are kind of really big ones for a lot of people with disabilities, especially for women, you know, um, you know, healthcare and, you know, how um, people with disabilities are, are treated around uh, you know, just just general, uh, you know, treated by uh, practitioners and um, especially regarding like, you know, um, like sexual health and reproductive choices. A lot of those kinds of things are not things that I was dealing with, you know, 31 years ago when I was a kid. So I don't know if they're better or worse <laughs> than they now than they were then. But I think, um, again, there have been, I think a lot of kind of improvements in terms of like things being physically accessible and people knowing that disability things are people are more aware that disability issues are issues but i think some of the you know societal approaches to them might be you know have shifted in a way that we don't approve of at the same time there are you know many doctors who take care of people with disabilities very well as you know as Katie mentioned, and as I mentioned, some of this is a little bit foreign because I, you know, was lucky to have really great doctors and have my, you know, parents help me pick great doctors. But I think so. I think there have been a lot of strides made, but also a long way to go in many other areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So, Juliana. Um, so what I really wanted to ask was, when you hear people using dehumanizing language about people with disabilities. How would you like somebody, um, like with my able-bodied privilege, to combat that? Because I want to, and but I'm not sure how to go about it. Uh, um, okay. Because a because ableism, uh, since I'm gonna face that, it's not ableism. It's able to do something, and it, and it's about teaching others and going out to the world and sharing all life, living all life. Um, 
Because the, that's why we're here, to get the word out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to add on to that um, because I think that what you just asked is one of the most important questions that somebody without a disability could ask, and I am so glad you asked it because I write about accessibility stuff all the time. <laughs> the elevator's broken, the door button's broken, there's no ramp, or there's an inch curb at the bottom of the ramp, and that doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> And when I do that, I often just get perceived as like the grumpy, angry, disabled person. Like, and eventually, like my words just they don't they don't have a lot of meaning anymore. Um, but when other people, um, especially other people, that it's not necessarily an issue for them themselves, um, but they're willing to take a stand and say, "Hey, you know, this building, the only entrance into it, um, I had to come up a step, and I could do that, but." That means that my friend Beth wouldn't be able to come here with me. I'm gonna go talk to the owner and see if they can put in a ramp. Um, something like that. I think that that would make a huge difference um, because it does show that people care about accessibility other than just people with disabilities. Um, and so when you have um, a lot of, with like physical accessibility and stuff like that, a lot of it happens just because the people who were designing it weren't aware of disability. I see it all the time on my campus when there's just, uh, <laughs> there's just so many things that individually are small um, and they may not even be entirely unaccessible, um, but they're not convenient um, or they may be entirely unaccessible. Um, when they built the uh, new library on my campus, they forgot to put in a ramp. I don't really know how you forget to put in a ramp um, in these times, um, but I went to the like grand opening, the new library, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Wish I could go inside. <laughs> um, and um, I, I had to get a lot of students to raise their voices um, and be like, hey, we need a ramp. Um, and they finally put in a ramp, but um, it does, when people, I think when people without disabilities stand with us, um, more than anything, it, it adds to the idea um, and the understanding that we are all people and what hurts one of us hurts all of us and what benefits one of us benefits all of us um, and that these are issues that we should all care about. Um, so when you see issues like that, I encourage you to be respectful, but I encourage you to use your voice um, to address the issue to whoever it needs to be addressed with. Can I also point out that uh, ramps and curb cuts are also helpful to people with strollers and carts? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, it's, there, there's, it's, it's more widespread helpfulness. Mm -hmm. Not to mention a person with a temporarily sprained ankle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to, just to uh, make one final comment about your uh, question about specifically dehumanizing language. Um, I think it is really important to stand up when you hear people, you know, using words like, you know, like retarded or things like that. Although, as I mentioned, you know, back when I was a kid, that was the acceptable term that was used. So these things change. Um, but, you know, specific words like that, I think it's important to, you know, stand up and tell somebody, oh, that's not okay. But I think one way in which sometimes able-bodied people will get a little bit, go a little bit overboard is kind of dictating to disabled people how they should talk about themselves. <laughs> like I say, I use the term disabled person just because mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier to say. I was an English major in undergrad and um, it's part of, you know, it's also part of my identity. I've had, you know, various people say that, you know, I, I must use person first language. I understand if it's a, you know, rule that some publication has, but, you know, I, you know, don't want to, I'm not a, you know, self-hating disabled person just because I don't talk in that particular way. And I think, you know, these really obviously um, dehumanizing words like, you know, cripple or spaz or things like that, you know, stop people from using, but don't, at the same time, don't police how disabled people talk about themselves. 